Isaiah chapter 63, 2 John, the 63rd book of the Bible. <clears throat> Who is this that cometh from Edom? Down south of Dead Sea area. Dyed garments of Badra. This, that is glorious in his apparel. Traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thy apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the white fat? Revelation 14, 19, Psalm 68, 21, and Jeremiah 25, 30. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people that was none with me, for I will tread them down, I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Lamentations 115, Revelation 14, 19, 1915. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my wreck redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Jeremiah 25, 15-38 That is a description of that little baby that was born in a manger. That cute little baby that the world loves to hold and change his diapers and lie. We mean lie. I mean, you know, have the shepherds and the wise men there all at the same time. And that little baby grew up and it's funny because I grew up in a church as a child we celebrated December 25th in that area that little baby little manger scene in Bethlehem and then we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ And yet the church I grew up with has Jesus Christ nailed to the cross daily. And even if I was a good little boy, I could go on and eat in Jesus. And say in my heart, I have received Jesus Christ. In a form of a round raven. The little baby at the end of the year, the little much of the resurrection, and yet the Jesus nailed to the cross. That is how religion maintains and upholds Jesus Christ. He's too small as a baby to do anything, and he's nailed to a cross that he has no power. Yet when I read passages like Isaiah 63 and Revelation, when Jesus Christ mounts on that horse, he's not coming back as a baby. He's not coming back as a savior. His eyes are not aimed for Calvary. You won't dare touch his hair, never mind to pull his beard. He has come to remove the curse off the earth rather than you put thorns upon his head. And you got to realize. If you reject the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as your salvation, the blood of you 
will be trampled by Jesus Christ, God is love. Thou shalt not kill. And your blood will be washed upon his garments. What do you guys say about the God of love when it comes to chapter 63? That probably never is ever to be read in a church. Of fairy dairies and blue tails and pussy cats and willows and Easter egg hunts. If you were to read this in your modern church and not just in America, but all around the world today, you would need paramedics with oxygen tanks and CPR to revive the people. Oh! That's not my God. Yes, that is not your God. And you'll probably die and go to hell thinking you are saved. But Isaiah 63 is my God. My God is holy. My God is righteous. And my God is angry when you reject his son. Imagine, as I preach on the street, you're too loud. Imagine the people crying out to Jesus, you're stepping on me. Why? You stepped on me your entire life. You used my name as a vein. You didn't receive what I had done for you. You don't even realize that Christians are being murdered in the name of religion today. And they're that peaceful kind of people. God loves sodomites too. You filthy liar. You filthy condemned sinner in the name of God the Lord Jesus Christ. God is angry. And this is not preached. They're not going to recognize this Jesus when he comes back. Because he's not in a manger. He's not on a cross. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, it says in the Romans, and I believe in Psalms. And this is the day of vengeance. You Christ rejecting sinner. You will pay for your own sins in hell for all eternity when you don't have to. This is the other side of God. This is the holy, righteous, judging God. That has all right because he has done everything possible for you not to be on his bad side. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son shall have not life. I'm not quoting that verse completely. But shall see the wrath of God abiding upon him. And that's in Isaiah 63. And that is when you're cast into hell. And that is when you're put into the lake of fire for all eternity. That is the condemnation. And we'll be coming to Jeremiah pretty soon. Lord willing. We've had a hard time coming to Isaiah 63. Satan has attacked the Christians. Satan has tried to stop the Christians. Satan has tried to stop the world. Satan has tried to stop the word. One day the Lord Jesus Christ will put a stop to it all. And at this point he'll take Satan and lock him up. And destroy all those that are after Satan. Because we are at the seventh year of the tribulation period. And most of the world is going after Satan. But he doesn't, he doesn't win. 
the Lord Jesus Christ will win. I look and there was none to help. That's it. You ain't going to stop the wrath of God. Don't even come up with a movie for it. I will mention the lovely kindnesses. Now, isn't that great? Or vengeance, verses 1 through 6, and the loving kindness of the Lord. Seven years of Satan. A moment of the Lord Jesus Christ angry. A sword coming out of his mouth. Stepping and trampling and burning the enemies of God. Thou shalt not kill. Coming for his people that God really hates and is thrown off into hell permanently. KKK and those other morons and uh, churches that doesn't think that God's all done with Israel. How how yanky for God to have his have the people's blood on his thing and, and to kill people like that. that that's not a, that, that's not my God, Prozac. Give me a tranquilizer. Find me a new church. I want the cute little Jesus. But here you go, Jesus. Work yourself, please. Come on. I want the Jesus that's nailed by his hands and nailed by his feet because he can't go nowhere and can't touch me. I'll hang him between my breasts. I'll tattoo him to my body. Because I have control of Jesus. No, you don't. And when my Jesus Christ gets victory over the enemies of myself because of the word. Because I'm going to be behind Jesus all the way. On horseback. And we're going to watch the nation of Israel get picked up. Get put on the bandwagon. And I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed upon us. And the great goodness towards the house of Israel. That wrathful upon the wicked. And when the wicked had dealt with, and the goats have been put into the lake of fire, God is love. What would you do? Let's take a wedding. Here's a wedding. And in the building, they're all... Families both sides. What would you do if you knew there was a group of people in that building that has insulted the bride their entire life, has humiliated that bride their entire life, maybe have hurt that that woman in her life, has caused her pain and sorrow in her life, tried to abuse her, in your life and has ruined her name in her life would you keep on saying be, be, as you go to the honey to the to the reception the honeymoon here just stay here sit at this table everything be okay we all love each other here no you take those rascals and you throw them out and you would make a great show of these people are not allowed here And if you think God loves everybody, and you think that my holy God is going to welcome you into the, the thousand year reign of his son when you use his name as a curse, I defy and, and renounce that God if that's your God.
if you have spoken ill of his people, the Jews, I don't want you in the gathering of a place called Israel, called Jerusalem. And God don't want you there either. And yet, Christian, you sit there and you associate yourself with people who don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are a phony. I don't care who you are. I don't care who the person is. And when you say you love that person that doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a liar to Jesus. And you don't have to answer to it. The Bible tells you separation from the ungodly. I don't care who they are. I have. Because my God is holy, he'll separate the wicked from his presence. Even if you will not. You gotta understand who God is. He will not have it in his presence. He will not have it before his bride. We are his bride. He is before us. He will not let us be in the company of Christ rejecting, of people who reject the nation of Israel, those that have nothing to do with him. He removes them out as we come. He separates the goats from the sheep. The goats are verses 1 through 6. The sheep are verse 7. What's he going to do? Gather a nation of Israel up and bring them into Satan? And the nations that hated him? They would devour the nation of Israel. You got to realize when you sin, when I sin, we anger God the Father. God hates sin, and it looks like he hates the sinner. Especially when they reject him over and over. That's that loving, peaceful God who came out of the tomb three days later. Who is long-suffering that during this time called the church period, he sends people like us to your door, to your neighborhoods, to your places of, of business to preach the gospel, to show you an open Bible so you do not get the revenge and vengeance of God. But the choice is yours. Great goodness towards the house of Israel. They are God the Father's people. Even though they are set aside, God has them as the apple of his eye. They are never, never, utterly, eternally forsaken. Never. That is a false teaching out of hell. You know why religion and people say the Lord's Prayer today? Because they're trying to steal the promises of Israel. You know why religions go in the name of war for their kingdom? Because they're trying to steal the blessings of Israel. The Christ rejecting the God forsaken people are gone, verses 6 and 7. 
He turns his love back to Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. And when you read Revelation 12, it says God has prepared a place for them. This is the same God that said to me, I go prepare a place for you. I have a mansion I am building for you. God has a place where there will be no sin. There will be nobody that will reject Jesus Christ. There will be a place where no one uses his name but praise and honor and glory. God is going to separate these wicked people from us, even if you won't. You will have separation. In New Jerusalem, all they that are saved will be there. At the rapture, only those that are saved will be in the air. No one else. He doesn't cost he doesn't call the laws. He'll separate you from those who have nothing to do with him. Those that reject Christ will be left behind. Those who reject God will be stamped upon. You reject Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ will reject you. That's the holy, merciful God that's not preached. That is the doctrine of separation that is not taught. You got to realize, some of the people you hang out with, people, angers God. Your conduct angers God. According to his multitude, multitude of his loving kindness. God is all loving. Well, how can you say verses 1 through 6 then? Because he's all holy. We don't know how to love. Because God is love, and love is of God. One day when we get to heaven, Revelation 12, we are going to watch God cast Satan out of heaven forever. God will separate himself totally from the enemy. And then God will separate himself from the enemy that follows the enemy. You know how he prepares the, the Israel in chapter 63? He prepares Israel and how Israel didn't prepare themselves. You say, what are you talking about? When Israel went in with Joshua, there was victory after victory after victory. Only one battle Joshua lost. That was because of one man. A Babylonian garment, a wedge of gold, and a block of silver, whatever it was. That's it. But do you know how Israel lost? They didn't kill everybody. They didn't get rid of all the nations like they were supposed to. Even Joshua had one group of guys come in, and <coughs> they framed themselves to be somebody who they weren't, and they allowed to be peace with them. Saul was supposed to get rid of Amalekite, and he didn't. And you read his name all the way through the Bible when he was supposed to be destroyed. The Philistines were a thorn in the, in the Israelites' uh, lives in the Bible, and they were supposed to have been gotten rid of. So God says this time, before I put you in the land, I will get rid of your enemies first.
Then I'll bring you into the land. Where there will be no enemies. Like you were supposed to do back when you started as a nation. But you didn't do it. And when you do not separate yourself. God may have to do the separation for you. That's what he's telling Israel. They didn't do it. Had Israel listened to God when they went into the promised land like they were supposed to, they would have been a city on a, on a hill with a light to all the nations. But instead they joined themselves and joined themselves to their sins. And you say, what's wrong with America today? The church has joined herself to Satan. When you can walk into a Baptist church and see a Christmas tree, when you can walk into a Baptist church and see a, plot, a plaque given by the city council. When you can walk into a Baptist church and they're handing out tickets to a, 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 a keg party. When you can walk into a Baptist church and they got a biker's kind of thing. When you can walk into a, a, a Baptist church and they got a perverted Bible. When you can walk into a church and have an Easter egg hunt. When you can walk into a Baptist church and you read Duncan the pastor in a dunking booth. When you're walking into a Baptist church and I just keep going on and on and on and on. You had mingled yourself with the world. And if you don't believe it, read the Ladder to See in Church Age. You make God sick. You know what Israel's problems? They're making God sick. See, there's no evolution. Everybody gets everybody gets wrong, worse, terrible. Work. I was married once. And the fact is that evolution did not work. My wife died to cancer. I have remarried. And with evolution, I'm sorry to say that, that in the in my wife, as she grows and as I grow, we are not getting fairer and younger and beautiful as we age. We are getting broken. We are getting wrinkles. We're getting gray hairs. We're getting old. How can evolution be taught by an old man before a young class is? Doesn't that make you think, wait a minute, everything's getting better and better. What's that old hair, gray hair guy up there taking pills? The nation Israel has, de has, has degraded. The church has degraded. God has to step in. God will step in one day with the rapture of the church. We're out of here. God is going to step in for Israel by the Lord Jesus Christ coming. See, if God didn't step in, we'd go totally, I don't know where we would go. Loving kindness. Loving kindness is when God steps in. What if you were out in a pool or in a body of water somewhere and, and you're drowning? Wouldn't you want the loving kindness of God to step in the water and pull you out? Israel is so much in trouble and so much God's I gotta step in and go get him. Why doesn't he do it earlier? I don't know if this is true, but I was told by somebody somewhere along the line. And I have a sister who was a lifeguard, maybe her, I don't know. They told me, he says, you can't save a drowning person until they're almost passed out. That if, if They told me that whoever it was, that if you see someone drowning, don't go after them right away. Because they're going to drag you down under the water themselves in the fighting. And you know, if you were to go tell a Jew today about Jesus Christ, most of them in the world today, come with me downtown. Watch how they fight you.
He's got to have Israel running scared in a place that is just completely forsaken. That's a loving kindness. See, the enemies are gone. Now that they're in Selapitra, they're scared. Then he comes to rescue them with a the lifeline. For he says, surely they are my people. Don't you recognize this verse 1 through 6? What do you recognize that as? You recognize that as the, as the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Well, if God is all through with them, what is he saying they are my people after the second advent? We are in the church age right now. Right now is the church age. Rapture. Seven year tribulation period. Second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see after the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, he still says they are my people. When I first entered the prison down here in Florida ministry, I have met Jewish men and I'm afraid. You afraid of men? No, I'm not afraid of men. I'm afraid of offending them, the Jews. Because they are God's people. I want to make sure I don't make no jokes. I want to make sure I don't do anything that offends that Jew because they are God's people. I want to do whatever I can to show them the Christ and show them God. Why? Because he says, they are my people. Children that will not lie. You want to believe that's today? So he was their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. Why? Why does an angel show up to us today? Because we don't require signs. The nation of Israel has been sign after sign after sign after sign. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, bought them back. He bought them. He paid for them. He'd be a fool just not to have anything to do with them. Right now, they don't want anything to do with him. That's okay. He's long-suffering. We're not. See, God's bound by his word, and he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he bared them and carried them all the days of old. Then you go back and read the Old Testament, how God protected them, especially in the book of Judges. They did wrong, they repented, he helped them. They did wrong, they repented, he helped them. That's my Christian walk, day to day, hour by hour. I sin, I go to the Lord, he protects me and helps me. Okay, and then I sin again. I repent, get right. He loves me, protects me, helps me. And then I do something else stupid and wrong. You know? For every red light I get, I do something wrong, and I repent, get right, and I get to the next red light. Eventually, about the tenth right, I finally say, okay, Lord. Stu carries me along. I'm not smoking. I'm not a pile of rubble. He bought me. Well, you know, he gets angry with me. Over a little thing of patience. And yet I have the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Father, calm down. He's under the blood. He's one of ours. His name's in the book. He's your son. Give him a couple green lights. Yeah, I know what will happen next. We'll step on that gas pedal. You see how much we're sinners? Yeah, I'm only trying to tell you I'm human too. The nation of Israel 
is in the wrong. And he still loves them. But in his holy righteousness, if they reject Jesus Christ, they will burn in hell as much as a Gentile. What worse gift can a Jewish person have but spend eternity with a dead, rotten dog burning in hell? And they don't have to. That God says with them, he's got to give them a new heart and a new spirit. And I'm trying to teach because there are people out there that say God's all finished with them and they're not. I pray often for anybody who God knows as a missionary, somebody who works with Jews, that I don't need to know them. God does. That I pray for them. Whoever and wherever they are. If they're trying to lead Jewish people to Lord Jesus Christ, trying to help them in any way the Bible approves of, I pray for them. But you know what my pastor told me? There is a guy that's over Israel right now, and he's doing just that. But in Israel, it is against the law to preach the Bible to them. He's got to do it in underground. Wait a minute. You mean the Jews have a law about you teaching them the Bible about God? Yes. Pharisees were setting laws against Jesus all the time. Look at verse 10. But they rebelled. I rebelled. I rebel often. And vexed his Holy Spirit. Come on, Christian. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit indwells with you. Do you think the Holy Spirit enjoys breathing in that smoke? Do you think the Holy Spirit enjoys that alcohol coming down into it? Do you think the Holy Spirit enjoys to see that naked body that is not to be seen na nakedness? You think the Holy Spirit really enjoys to steal something? I was thinking you can grieve the Holy Spirit, you can resist the Holy Spirit, you can vex the Holy Spirit. And there's one other one that, that Paul, there's three of them that Paul speaks about. Grieve, I don't know how you say grieve. But here it says you can vex the Holy Spirit. Grieve. Can you imagine as a Christian? The Holy Spirit saying, oh, man, what are you making me do? And then he goes into the prayer that cannot be uttered to God. And then you wonder why you got troubles and tribulations and problems in your life and you're making the Holy Spirit do what it doesn't want to do. Making it look, touch, smell, eat, taste. what it ought not be doing. And I read an article the other day that said there's more than five senses. The senses of being able to, to, to tell with, the, the, with salt, sugary. They're trying to prove that that's senses too. And there were a few, I, I wish I, I'd get rid of things I shouldn't get rid of and keep things I shouldn't keep. And it was very good. That would be perfect right now for this thing. And the nation of Israel, you know what they're doing to the Holy Spirit that's trying to teach them and trying to show them the way of Christ, trying to rebuke them of their sin? We're okay. It's the Gentiles causing all our problems. We're doing exactly what God wants us to do by the law, without the temple, without doing, you know, going three times a year. And, you know, we're following and obeying the law without the battlement upon our and the Holy Spirit's looking at the nation of Israel like, oh boy. 
Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy. Holy Spirit said, you're on your own. And you know what Israel today is doing? They're not crying out to God. They're crying out to the United Nations. Help us. Yeah, we'll move the fence back a little more. Give us a little peace. Yeah, we'll cut down on the missiles. Can we have a little more? And they're losing ground. Literally. And he, God, fought against them. Would you really want God to fight against you? Remember what he did to Pharaoh crossing the Red Sea? He took the wheels right off and then closed up the war. Will you really want God on your bad side on that? Or would you rather have God for your side and have like a couple of submarines waiting for you or something? Then he remembered the days of old, Moses. Why mention Moses? What group of people, what, what one person did a group of Jews give the hardest time in their entire life? Moses. Moses did not get in the promised land because he got mad at them at the rock. And cussed him and yelled at him and screamed at him. And his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Red Sea. Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within them? They led them by the, by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm. Divided the water before them and make yeah, and make himself an everlasting name. That Red Sea was a testimony to them. Where Paul says they were baptized with the baptism of Moses when they went through that Red Sea. After they were redeemed, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. They went through the baptism. They became God's people. Where's the water? Where's the food? We're going back. Make us another God, Aaron. God, why'd you kill those people? Moses, why'd you kill those? The ground opens up, swallows Dathan and his group, and they said, Moses, why'd you do that? How did Moses have the power? Well, he opened the water, didn't he? Didn't he do great things with that rod? They forgot about God. And led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness they should, that they should not stumble. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. God was with them all the way. You got to go back to history. You got to go back. Hey, Jew. Hey, Israel. Go back to when God took you out of Egypt. God loved you and brought you out and brought you through that sea. And got rid of your enemies behind you. And when remember when Miriam gathered the, the, the temple there and started dancing and started singing with the with the women. Look down from heaven, and behold, from the ha from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory, where is thy seal and thy strength? The sounding of thy bowels, the inside of you, and thy mercies towards me. Are they restrained? Yes. God is yearning. Like he's really got to go potty. To help the Jew. He loves that Jew so much. He wants to. You ever have a child that you, you've you got something for him. You want to give it to him. You, you, you want to make him happy. But they just been so bad you can't. You got to hold it off. Doubtless, thou art our father. Through, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel knowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father. 
our Redeemer. Thy name is forever lasting. Israel is the, ch is the children of God. But God in His holiness, if they will not listen to their father, you know how you have God become your father today? It's not by being born through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That won't save you today. In order to be saved today and have God as your father, you need to be born again by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to have the Holy Spirit and dwell with you in the, the spirit that Christ ever followed by God adopted us by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how God becomes your father and you get saved today. You can be born of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get that new spiritual birth, God is not your father. Don't you claim it. And when Jesus Christ comes again, verses 1 through 6, when he redeems them, that's when they become his children. And they become his father after the second advent. O oh Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways? Blaming God. Who did that, Adam? Who did that, Eve? Who did that, Israel in the wilderness? Who did that, we do? We always blame somebody else. It's that miserable boss. It's that miserable husband. It's the pastor of the church. It's the woman that sits in front of us. It's that red light. We're always blaming. We play the blame game. And harden our hearts, our heart from thy fear. See, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord, they have no fear of God. You know why people did not come to be saved this morning in Daytona Beach? Because they do not fear God. They think hell and, and damnation is a joke. You imagine that rich man, as soon as he opened his eyes, what did the Bible say? He was in torment instantly. Return for thy servant's sake. Look at that. They've got to want to God return, and he's going to. They are going to be praying this prayer in 17 in Seal of Petra. And God's going to say, you want me to return? <laughs> oh, yeah, please return. Please, Lord. Okay. Son, yes, mount up. Grab your bride, mount up. They want you to come. And then guess what? Instead of being on a coat of an ass, he's going to be on a thoroughbred white, I don't know what kind of horse. And they're not going to yell crucify him a week later. They're going to be yelling praise him, praise him for a thousand years and more. Return for thy servant's sake, the tribes of thy inheritance. The people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. So what does God do in verses 1 through 6? He returns the favor. Trod me down. Be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever, man. Here's a man in the great white throne judgment. He, he's been judged. And God tells him, go to hell. Well, God, why? Because I offer you my son. I wanted something else. 
Well, I'll give you something else. You rejected me. I'm going to reject you. And the, the what you sow is a lot more than what you reap. That's a life law. God in His holiness sent you somebody to tell you what God expects, and you did not trust it. I said today, there are 48 prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled all 48 of them. Prophecy number 49, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. If 48 prophecies came to pass 100%, 49 prophecies that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, that's going to be fulfilled 100%. As with prophecy number 51, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be cast into hell. Prophecy 51 would be just as much as the 48 fulfilled, and never mind all they're going to be happening. But people don't fear God. We are thine. So they've got to acknowledge. Verse 15 to 19 is a going to be a type of prayer. We're running out of time, which we aren't. Of the Jew. It's, I'll say sell the people, but wherever that place God has prepared for them, they got to acknowledge that God looked down upon us in your holiness, in your zeal, from your bowels. You are our Father. You got to acknowledge God, acknowledge that He has redeemed them. Thy name, there is no other name given by, amongst men whereby ye must be saved. And then they blame God for their troubles. They acknowledge that they don't have the fear of God. They say, God, return for us. We are the tribes. We are thy inheritance. The people of thy holiness. The adversaries have come against us. Trod them down. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. Satan has. They were not called by thy name. Who was not called by thy name? Uh, let's start off with first. Let's see the Philistines. The Canaanites. Shall I mention the names of the people that Israel has joined with they weren't supposed to? And the false gods of Molech and burning their children and the tree worship and the, and the high places and all that. Shall we get into those? Shall we get into the names of Solomon's wives and the gods of those? Shall we get into the names of the Babylonians that Israel went and joined themselves to? That Ezra and Nehemiah had to deal with the mixed marriages? Shall we get into the Romans? The Russians, the Germans, that were not called by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ from God. The Ishmaelites, the Arabians, the PLOs, the Afghanistans, the, all these people that are not called, the United Nations was not called by thy name. God the Father, reach down. We need your help. Only you can help us. Get on that horse. Come into Jerusalem and we'll shout Hosanna to God, to Jesus Christ for all eternity at this point. We will never say again, your blood be upon us and our children. How about your blood will wash us away from our sins. We'll be forever yours. How about that? How about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleansing the nation of Israel once and for all, pleasing God? And then Jesus Christ comes and steps out the enemy. 
Would you really want to see the, the Jewish people get right and, and get honored with Jesus Christ and God and be in the land with a bunch of enemies that hated them? You can't have it. You can't have the enemies of God all together. They've got to go. Jesus Christ one day will separate all the workers of wickedness of Satan from those that are the fathers. The children of God saved, the children of God Jews, the children of God will be separated from the children of Satan. And they'll be never in the same playpen again. They won't be in the playground again. When that angel comes and, and harvests the earth, you know, there was, there was he went out and put seed in the field, and the enemy came and sold tares among the wheat. So they gathered up those tares and put them in the barn, put them in the fire, and gathers up the wheat and puts it into the barn. The barn is a different place from the fire. <laughs>